Okay, hello everybody. I see uh, we, uh, I forgot to put the timer on today. So we got students in a bit early, that's fine. Well, actually, folks, are you logging in from, oh, someone said November 7th, November, oh my, I can't trust my uh, tech team to do anything. Oh, well. It's just going to edit this. The no, January 2023 on the 9th at 620. All right. Hey, Mark. Hey, how's it going? Good. Uh, I uh, there was a a bunch of mistakes by the tech team, um, so I got I got students in a little earlier today. Now, but now it should set properly, so we'll, we should see students coming in in uh, ten minutes or so, or five five minutes. But okay, early students. How are you, Mark? Uh, not too bad. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Give me a second to just get my sound on. So I think. You can hear me? Yep. Uh, since students are here, do a sound check. Everybody hear us okay? You can yes. just uh, type on the uh, on the side while, while, while we see how people are doing. Uh, how's everybody's break? How's your break, Mark? <laughs> Not too bad, yeah. Too short, but other than that, uh, kids are- uh... your brother. <laughs> eight and five now so it's uh it's prime time for the holidays right they're uh yeah they're not questioning uh, the existence of santa yet or anything so <laughs> five they're not questioning yet eight and five well i think it's kind eight. of uh our eight-year-old strategic right so he's like well if, if oh, uh, they think okay. i don't believe i might get less toys <laughs> <laughs> yesterday uh no two, yesterday was it no the two days ago, my daughter lost a tooth, right? And oh, yeah. She doesn't, she doesn't really believe Santa and Tooth Fairy, but she also does because she gets presents. Totally. So my girlfriend's had a letter printed out from the Tooth Fairy Council complaining of the declining quality of her tooth due to lack of brushing. Oh, and so there you uh, go. we are not able to uh, reimburse you for the tooth next time if we don't see improvement. <laughs> oh man, there you go. That's right, you know, like the whole Santa's watching you. You're not gonna, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. and uh, or the elf on the shelf. Someone shelter, is, but... uh, someone says they're reading crafting interpreters during the break. Well, by interpreter, you're talking about, uh, Kind of compiler interpreter for computers, yeah. Well, we, we have a very keen computer science students here. These are <laughs> computer science students, Mark, and uh, that's good for you, Henry. Um, I did not. I I by December twenty second, I turned off my email. I set uh, away message for the first time in my life. I, wow. I, I'm like I, I have I've never done it, but this good first time you. in my that's... life. I'm away for uh, until uh, January fourth. That was nice. I wasn't um, I wasn't able to do that this year, so I'm jealous. But um, oh, hey, Kai, can you uh, can you give me a screen oh, sharing or uh, make me? Yeah, a I'm gonna do that, and I'm gonna actually pause. Okay. Going to get get recorded, and we can get back to that chat if we want to. Uh, Mark, uh, let me just introduce uh, Mark Abbott here. Mark Abbott is the uh, um, you're the director, right? You're the director of technology stewardship at uh, Mars Discovery and uh, and the managing director of engineering change lab. Did yeah, I get the titles correct? Yeah, here's right, a cheat sheet for you, yeah. Oh, Although, there, yeah, there managing go. director of tech stewardship network in the engineering change lab, yeah. Uh, there, there we go. And uh, so Mark and I knew each other for, I wanna say about seven years now. And uh, when uh, when Mark was just, you were just about to leave engineering, uh, you were just started engineering change lab and, uh, and was still with engineering without borders. And, uh, and I was, I was a grad, I was a graduate student postdoc at Denmark. 
right? And uh, you had a big part to play in me coming back to Canada, eventually coming becoming a professor, actually. Oh, and um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, so Mark has been a friend of Lasan for the entire time as well. And uh, Lasan School of Engineering had a large role in, uh, and I would say, that's fair to say, right? We had a totally. we had a pretty large role in getting engineering change lab started, and uh, which eventually evolved into the tech storeship network as is now. Which uh, you know, and and I would say Mark is definitely one of the leaders in the let's call it a is it a new field? It's not a new field. What do you call tech storeship? You are you are the really yeah. the catalyst and the guy that's getting everybody paying attention to tech storeship in Canada. I'm going to, I'm going to just pass it on to you now, Mark. Sure. Um, <laughs> hi everyone. Oh, this one is second. A... Hi, so, just so I will, as usual, be capturing all the uh, questions on um, chat so that uh, like, I'll feed it to Mark. Cool. So um, uh, hi everyone. Uh, it looks like we've got 86, 87 right now. So it's a big group, but actually not that big. And I'm going to uh, go out on a limb here and say there's some people who are maybe half listening and some people are a bit more engaged. So, um, you know, uh, really looking forward to maybe engaging a little with uh, a few of you who are, um, have got the time and interest to kind of come in a little bit more. My background, um, I'm an engineer by training. So UBC Mechanical Engineering um, uh, graduated back in the 90s, had a first kind of more traditional career in consulting engineering for almost 14 years, did an MBA along that way, uh, started volunteering with Engineers Without Borders over that period, and um, eventually got to the point where I was spending more time on my Engineers Without Borders volunteer work than my high-paid, cushy leadership role in this engineering company. So about 10 years ago, um, moved from Vancouver to Toronto to join the executive team of Engineers Without Borders. Um, and it was through that work with Engineers Without Borders, this idea of launching the Engineering Change Lab um, came up, which was about you know, the world's changing fast and how does the engineering community, broadly speaking, so engineers, computer scientists, technologists, how do we have to adapt to kind of um, live up to our potential in a changing world? And from that work emerged this bigger concept of tech stewardship. And, um, you know, Kai, you're asking about kind of the roots of it. So Lassonde has been a champion of the Engineering Change Lab that kind of brought out tech stewardship and everything since the beginning, since eight years ago, um, you know, there's been multiple professors and, and the deans involved in um, in the Engineering Change Lab and Tech Stewardship. So really, everything we're sharing here today has a real um, Lasan kind of grounding and, and Lasan can take kind of credit for all of this work because it's really been a collaborative. It's like leaders from across the community, from academia, industry, government, nonprofit, um, you know, all coming together to do this work of sort of looking at how the world's changing and how the engineering community, broadly speaking, um, needs to evolve. And so from that emerged this concept of tech stewardship, which we're going to be talking about today. And um, somewhere in the chat there, someone was asking about chat GPT. Um, I'm going to guess a bunch of you have heard of chat GPT and, and those of you who haven't probably will soon. Um, you know, Google it afterwards. It's just the latest example of how technology is like, you know, um, is radically, uh, um, you know, starting to change our world. And, and chat GPT, if you it won't take you much Googling to find a whole bunch of like doomsday stories about how it's going to undermine a bunch of industries. And there's going to be no more, um, everyone's going to be cheating on exams because they're just going to be asking chat GPT to, to write their answers for them. And, and, um, and so it's an interesting time in which you're doing computer science where the power and the perils of technology are becoming more and more apparent, right? And you, um, you know, you're learning how to create those cutting edge technologies as computer scientists. So what does that mean for you? So today, tech stewardship, um, we're going to be talking about um, a way to think about, you know, your own identity as a computer scientist and the role that you could play in, um, you know, in creating a, a better world. And so we're going to do that with like a few rounds of like dialogue, which I know is hard with this kind of setting. But um, um, in the chat right now, if you're willing, um, I'd love to get some people's feeling of like, where are we headed? So, you know, as a society, we all go to the movies and see all of these, you know, kind of potential dystopian tech futures. And every once in a while, you get more of a utopian like Star Trek next generation. So the question is, if we don't do anything, 
thing differently as a society. If we just, it's kind of like more, you know, um, the dynamics of how tech and innovation kind of happens continue in the way they are. What type of future are we headed for? Are we, do you think the default trajectory is towards that Star Trek next generation where, you know, enlightening humanity and expanding in the university or, or are we headed to a, you know, Terminator, Matrix, Black Mirror kind of setting? This is the type of question for which there is no right or wrong answer. And it's really how you're feeling at this moment. Like maybe today you're feeling pessimistic and tomorrow you're gonna to feel optimistic, but I'd love to get a sense of just where people are at in terms of um, you know, your emotion at this moment, your, your sense and why. And so if you want, you can put it in the chat, like throw a number in, I'm a, I'm a two, I'm a four, I'm a six because, you know, and then maybe a sentence or two about your rationale. Um, I'm also gonna put in the chat here a, um, a link to a mural board. So if you prefer, you can come in here and grab, um, you know, a, a post-it and put in like um, your, you know, maybe your name and uh, a number and actually um, visually come in and put yourself up on the continuum somewhere so we can get maybe a little bit of a visual as well. And as, I don't know, Kai, as people are putting things into the chat, if you if you are able to grab a few, maybe make a little bit of a representation. Yeah, I, I, can, I can do that, no problem. I'm gonna try to capture folks uh numbers in the mirror board. Cool. And while we're doing this, um, if we could get some people who are, um, who wouldn't mind like, you know, sharing a little bit about their logic, maybe if someone, some brave souls who don't mind maybe putting their hand up and unmuting and just talking through. And again, there's no right or wrong answer here. There's no gotcha. This is how you're sort of feeling at this moment about, you know, um, this is where I think things are headed. So is there any, any brave soul who might be willing to share their, their thinking? Anifa in the chat there, I think we're already somewhat at a black mirror situation. And yet you only put a five as your number. So that's kind of, a, that's, a, I would have expected a lower number in that case. But um, uh, Sanjana, or sorry, San, uh, Jay, no, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it. It's okay. Name. You can just call Sanjay. Uh, sorry. Sanjay. I just don't, how do you use the tool? Or can I just uh, say my. Yeah, position? you can say it. Just say it. Yeah, yeah, go for it. I think it's going to be a three because, like, from what I see, chat gpt is just going to be the excel for my generation it's going to be big but it's not going to change the world and i think it's just going to solidify what we uh current inequalities you usually see gotcha so you're um you're not buying the height like some people would say J chat gpt is going to make the world of three because that's going to have this huge disruption you're saying more it's not going to be that big a disruption but that's a bad thing because things are actually not going so well right now with inequalities and and so it's it's not going to help with those challenges. Is that what is that what you're saying? Yeah, and I kind of just referencing like you know how like if you look back in the seventies, eighties when dishwashers and laundry machines came into play into the home, it was said that oh, most of the time this was marketed against women, and so yeah. this would free them. But at the end of the day, when you look back. Just kind of just give them oh you have more time on your hands here's more work and yeah. the same kind of cycle happened with uh, i think in the 90s where oh computers are going to take away our uh jobs when it came to like uh special effects artists it yeah. really didn't it just give you new tools yeah yeah or like the elevator uh attendant who's no longer in. and so you're seeing some of these like uh you're seeing some of these things just sound like kind of a repeat the sky is falling it doesn't, it's, it actually just kind of gets baked in, but then things continue to trend to sort of some inequalities and injustice um, regardless. Okay, awesome. Um, who's on the, someone on the optimistic side, does anyone argue, want to argue for like a, a nine or 10 or maybe an eight? I think, I think we've got, uh, we got side, side high with an eight and someone with a seven, Pratik Roy with a seven. And uh, I don't know if either of those students wants to speak up here. I'm just reading on the chat. And uh, Printik, I hope I'm not kidding your name here, says that seven technology is changing. Oh, he's just put his so hand up. We oh, can uh, let him go. Oh, yeah. there we go. You, go can, for you it. can talk. Go for it. I mean, like, from what I've seen and from what I've, like, well, watched in YouTube, uh, like from what other people are talking, yeah, technology has changed like society a lot. Like as like technology itself changes, we've had to adapt in order to like change along with it. 
And because of that, like, even though some of those effects are positive and some of those effects are negative, like, you know, as I mentioned, like, in, in the comment, so far, the effects aren't too extreme yet. So as long as we have enough foresight, I feel like we can, like, make sure that the positives outweigh the negatives. Cool. And that gives you that gives you hope and optimism that there's a chance to kind of manage that evolution. Excellent. That's great. And yeah, I mean, it's interesting, like, you know, the social scientists who study the nature of technology and our relationship with it, some of them point out, like, you know, if you go way back in time to like the beginning of humanity and, you know, humans starting to use fire, um, they'll point out that actually over time we evolved as a species less strong jaws because we were pre-digesting our food by cooking it first. And so, yeah, you know, there's been this kind of like co-evolution, even at a biological level, we sort of adapt and co-evolve with our technologies. I think the difference that's happening now a little bit is the power and pace of technologies. Like it used to take, you know, long periods of time and be really hard to kind of spot, but now technology is so powerful and is rolling out so quickly that some of the sort of the, um, the questions and the challenges of that co-evolution become really apparent. Um, great comment in here from Rambir about, um, I believe in a capitalist society, technology will move towards um, the better people or will uh, not move, um, but only for the financial benefit of those in charge. Great point. I think that's one that often comes up. It's like, you know, the, the over a lot of people argue the overarching kind of thing is more capitalism and and the incentive systems and the power systems within within that's a great point. Um, anyone else want to like there's a lot of great stuff in the chat here. Anyone else want to share again? There's no right or wrong. These are just kind of opinions. Um, anyone else want to uh, speak up and share their thoughts? Oh, Kai's got one. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to raise my hand more. It's both Danny actually talked about this idea of society uh, will adapt, right? And, uh, and and I think there's a lot of conversation. I, I, I mean, I, I've been at kind of a periphery of this tech stewardship, as you know, Mark. Right, and one of the things uh, coming from uh, both as a engineer, a computer scientist, and I'm a, a bit of a mix, and a and a biologist, right? I actually, more specifically, ecologist. One of the thing is the key thing is the pace, right? Uh, evolutionary time does not happen in years, decades, right? Well, we're we're really seeing fundamentally we're behaving differently within a very short period of time compared to the uh, you know hundreds of years, that, which is still a blink of light eye for evolution, but at least you get some capacity to adjust, right? So, so one thing that I keep thinking about more, I, more I've been thinking about it really the health impact. The health impact of all these things, when you look at human biology hasn't caught up to, uh, to be able to handle the amount of maybe data stimulation input and uh, and what's the what's the long term impact of that and, uh, and and what do we do with that right and uh, you know both of us are uh, you know we're both fathers of fairly little kids and uh, and then what's interesting to me talking about adaptation is at least for me I'm starting to seeing their curriculum change in response to technology. Right, I, I'm seeing. I, I'm seeing. You know, we were sitting with a class of computer scientists. I'm seeing uh, my daughter start to do coding in grade two, grade three math. Yeah. And of yeah. course, when they're talking about coding, they're not, talk, not talking about coding when we're talking about Python or, or 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 Java or MATLAB or something like that. But they're they're thinking about the way of thinking, right? That that that's yeah. to me a way to adapt. And uh, and and just uh, yesterday, my girlfriend and I was talking about uh, you know. How do how do we teach them digital health? Yeah, yeah, um, there's things like that. Yeah, no, and, and I mean, so this is great. Like in um, uh, later on, I'm going to be talking about the, like we have a tech stewardship practice program. And this is actually the first question we pose in the program. And even before offering it as part of the tech stewardship practice program, we've run hundreds of like small groups, big groups. Like we often use this as an icebreaker to start the conversation. And what you find in most groups is what you see here is kind of a spread. Everything from, you know, feeling people feeling pessimistic to optimistic to kind of in the middle. If you have a large enough group, you almost always see that whole range. And in fact, over time, what we start to see is archetypes in the responses. So on the pessimistic side, what's really interesting is 
um, you know, technology is like, you know, one of the things that makes us human, you could argue, so is storytelling. And if you think about our storytelling of the future, like when we go to the movies, most of our movies of the future are either directly or indirectly cautionary tales of us getting our relationship with technology wrong from Terminator, Matrix, like the whole Black Mirror on Netflix is a whole anthology of kind of near future failures of our relationship with tech and society, right? And so we know in our storytelling as a species how important it is to get that co-evolution with our technologies right. And so that's, you know, I think uh, kind of interesting, but a lot of us like, you know, in engineering, computer science, entrepreneurship programs, there's this sense of just like, you know, often a sense of like kind of techno optimism, like more technology equals better, just go faster, faster, faster. Well, it could be that we're just, you know, all we'll accomplish is accelerating our arrival in a Black Mirror episode. Um, on the optimistic side, you also start to see some real kind of trends in, in the conversation. So people will argue, yeah, we're building these tools um, that could cause problems, but they're also tools that can help us create solutions. And in fact, you know, we can, you know, that will tend to trump the problems. Like we'll be creating tools to actually create the world we want to see um, even faster than and, and deal with the challenges that we're kind of creating. People will also talk about how if you look at the long kind of arc of human history in, in most kind of um, metrics, like in terms of sort of material well-being and some of these other, you know, the, the overall trend, even though there's a lot of inequality and problems right now, is, is towards good. And so why wouldn't that, you know, into better um, kind of personal well-being? So why wouldn't that continue? So there's a bunch of kind of, again, sort of standard compelling arguments on the optimistic side. In the middle, you get a lot of people who are saying sort of like, it depends what we do next. And, you know, it depends on how some of these kind of conversations go, which I think is very, um, you know, is, 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 I think there's truth along the whole spectrum. And it's actually really useful whether we naturally lean to be sort of more optimistic in our, in our personal lives and our, and, or more pessimistic, both orientations actually get, are important. You know, we have both of, we all have both of those inside of us and we all have kind of like leanings within that. But to be sort of responsible stewards of technology, how do we actually make sure that we're listening to kind of both of those voices and getting, because, you know, our pessimism gives us our caution, right? And gives us our, you know, a little bit of like, wait a minute, whereas our optimism gets things done, right? And so how do we kind of channel the best of both of those? So when, when we've been asking this question over the last four or five years of different size groups, one of the things that always comes up is like, wait a minute, we've seen how badly this can go in the movies. So like, we're not willing to leave this up to chance, even if I'm optimistic. I think that we need to like make sure that this goes well because this is high stakes. So that leads us to the next question. Um, what's it going to take to make sure that this actually goes well? That, you know, that we don't wind up in a Black Mirror episode or a, or a Matrix Terminator kind of movie, right? So the next question is, if you could make one wish to help ensure technology is beneficial for all, what would it be and why? And so once again, you can, you can throw your responses into... Um, uh, into the chat, or we've also created a um, um, another little space in the mural here, if you want to like throw them on here. And again, if, if there's some brave folks who wouldn't mind kind of piping up, and, and this is another example of there's no right or wrong. Like if, 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 you know, if I knew the answer to this, we wouldn't have to have these conversations. So it's really like, it's going to be a lot of different things. And that's why we say one wish. What's one kind of like high leverage thing that you think would be really important? So go ahead and you can throw things into the chat or, um, um, and again, if there's some people that are kind of brave to like unmute and share their thoughts, that would be great as well too. All right, I'm gonna give you a second to think as you do that. Yeah, I gotta say, this is a really good question. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be stealing this question for, uh, with your permission, marking some other context. We got, uh, we got uh, Sanjay, Sanjay, yeah, go yeah. for it again. Sanjay, yeah. I'm going to be brave again and say uh, the one wish would be like remove inequality because I took a, soci a sociology course and what they basically, most of it revolved around tech. And what they basically said is that when you look at any piece of technology, there's some kind, there's always a portion of that technology where human interaction is, a necessity and by having that a piece portion or whatever on that piece of technology you're already making an assumption on who can handle it who has the accessibility to it and this creates inequality and just looking at that 
there's also the fact that technology can spread out and evolve. It ultimately is something that does evolve, that it, in, in, it takes action and changes its environment, but the environment also changes it. Yeah, so that, that co-evolution. And, and to your point, so it's like you get in a widening technological inequality where you know, in a capitalist system, it makes more sense to provide technology for the people with the resources. So they just keep getting, you know, a bigger and bigger yeah. advantage. You know, I spent half a year working and living in um, Northern Ghana with Engineers Without Borders. And I was the, um, in a district of 100,000 people, I was the only foreigner. And I was probably the only, this was about 10 years ago. And at the time you had these little like, um, like cellular sticks to get to the internet. And like, I knew how good the internet was from being, you know, in, in, in Canada. And so I kind of persevered and I had money to pay for these sticks and everything. I was probably, the, as a result, the only person with access to the internet in that district of 100,000 people regularly for that, that whole four or five months I was there. And when you think about what an advantage that is to be able to Google, you know, things about farming methods and like, you know, ask questions of all these sort of things, you know, you, you start to really feel that that inequality in, in, a, in a practical way. And uh, so I love that, that answer, Sanjay, about you know, if, if we want technology to be beneficial for all and not just for a subset of people, then how do we how do we um, how do we deal with that type of dy dynamic going forward? Um, excellent. What else have we got here? So um, in the chat here, I think we've got students who's just who's writing in chat instead of the mural, mural board there. Yeah, that's cool. And we've got a few in the mural here, too. There's someone adding in the mural. Oh, I, I, I see. Uh, I'd like for technology to be more accessible um and more accountable to the general public excellent yeah so there's there's actually some neat things going on around this like um there's a thing called a citizen jury is like a social technology that's been used in some nordic countries in other words where they've actually said okay some of these decisions the government's making around technology have huge impacts on society so they use kind of social technology from like from the from the legal system they actually convene a jury of citizens who then get presented things from from experts and they come up with either recommendations or sometimes even direct policy about how that that community, that society will actually, um, you know, um, accept that technology or not. And so you have things around sort of like, you know, um, there, I think there was actually one run in Calgary where it was around a question about how Calgary would fund its infrastructure. And they actually used a citizen jury or there's things around sort of how, um, uh, you know, um, genetically modified crops um would or would not be sort of taken up in society so this idea of public accountability and how you bring the general public into this important decisions is a great one uh kai go for it i want to answer uh pratik's question first because it's direct oh related. yeah so yeah i think pratik uh, pratik in um some cases um a lot of times it's a recommendation because the government's too scared to take it as direct policy but there have been some cases where it's been like like a jury it's like the, the you know the a representative group of society is actually going to make the um, make the uh, the recommendation. There's actually a consulting firm in Toronto called Mass LBP that actually specializes in these types of processes, and they've been used a little bit in Canada too as well. Um, another comment on here: freedom for the internet, like less censorship and stuff. Don't let politics ruin the internet. Great, you know, I think that's a great one, and I think a great a great um, example of the internet. I think of one that you see sort of the story continue to unfold because I think quite famously the early days of the internet I think the pioneers really put a really positive spin in a lot of ways on the technology in the early days but then you see that kind of you know get co-opted and like the in the arm wrestling and and now there's talking you know web 3.0 and how do we kind of reclaim some of the early values of the internet so it's you know oftentimes these things are you know it's always changing and evolving as well too but um you know the internet is sort of a base technology that uh the fate of it probably has a lot to do with how the overall will go as well too. Um, I, I missed the I mean, internet. <laughs> uh, I mean, one of the, that also reminds me of cryptocurrency, mm. how much of that, and it, which was really fascinating because uh, if you go back to the origin of cryptocurrency, it was this weird, almost anarchistic socialist way of taking down big banks. And yeah. a lot of people were, were really on that lane of thinking and uh, and uh, and cryptocurrency very quickly got out of that that uh, that mode of operation. Right. And became yeah. uh, really uh, mainstream is not the right word, whatever cryptocurrency is today. Right? Yeah. The, the, uh, 
the other thing when you talk about uh, when you talk about mass action, uh, I had read this fascinating novel. Uh, I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's uh, there's a pair of them, Damon and Freedom. Uh, it's about a decade old, and uh, and it really talks about. And this was before AI. It was uh, it was just it was in one book. It's this program and essentially uh, this yeah. which programmer died his dying act is on Leisha Damon which I think the students should know what it is but it's an automatic program to do a sequence of things that essentially disassembled most of the human governments yeah. and then uh, then set up its own essentially a anarchistic voting society right yeah. and, and that's basically using exactly what you're saying and the book explores what would happen if uh, if, if we actually do that yeah right? and, and uh, Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I think science fiction is a great, like, I mean, people imagining all these different ways is, is actually a really useful tool, you know, like um, tool for spotting uh, problems and creating public dialogue. And it kind of ties into, there's this comment here on one of the posts that's about, you know, on social media in particular. So it's, it's so prevalent. How do we create that digital literacy? How do we create that, you know, with kids and everything? Because, you know, that's the sort of thing where if you don't address that, it could really create a lot of rot in the longer term foundation. Um, you know, Vince in the chat was talking about a way to incentivize some disconnect from technology, which, of course, is the opposite of the, you know, right now you have the attention economy that Center for Humane Tech and others talk about where it's like, you know, you are the product. How do we keep your eyeballs on things? Is there a way to actually switch that incentive system? And then there's some clash classic examples like the Amish, quite famously, Amish communities. Um, you know, some people sort of take it as their anti-technology, but in fact, they're actually just much more discerning about technology. They, When a new technology comes out like cell phones, elders in an Amish community will actually assess the impact of that technology on the community and make a decision about if and, and how to um, engage with it. There's a really cool podcast that people are interested called Should This Exist, which um, basically interviews people that were early on in um, a bunch of really big um, transformative technology. So like smaller nukes, um, cloud brightening, um, bio artificial organs. And it's interviewing someone who played a big role kind of early on in these new technologies and basically asking like, okay, you've been involved in this a long time. There's some big concerns and maybe some downfalls coming up about it. Should you, should we have even created this in the first place? And inevitably the answer isn't yes or no. It's like, yes, with a caveat, we should have done this and this and this to make sure that, um, you know, we got more of the positive be benefits and less of the, um, of the sort of the downsides. And so once again, like all of these questions are actually drawn right from the tech stewardship practice program. And part of our practice is to keep coming back like to questions like this and sort of kind of coming at it from different angles and deepening our understanding. So we've asked probably thousands of people at this point, this question as well too. And again, you start to see archetypes in the response. And if you look at what's happening out there right now, in the last four or five years, we, we call it almost like a, um, like a 1960s moment. In the 1960s is where humanity kind of started to wake into the nature of our relationship with nature and the environmental movement kind of ensued, right? Like prior to 1960, even the word environment meant something different. It meant if you ask someone about the environment in the 1950s, they'd say, oh, we try not to make a mess. It was more like your immediate surroundings. In the 60s was when this kind of concept of the environment being this big complex system that humans were actually impacting at, at scale started to enter the public consciousness. And that launched the environmental movement that continues to unfold. We believe that you know, you're know you graduating into a world that's kind of in a 1960s moment where society is beginning to awake to the nature of our relationship with technology. And so um, one of the seminal moments was when the original Facebook scandal happened back in 2018, the Cambridge Analytica sc scandal around kind of the elections in the US that really seemed to spark a bunch of things all over the world. So you have all these new initiatives and declarations and, and it's it's really kind of just growing right now. And so, um, you know, in your career, I believe it's gonna be more and more important for you. If you wanna differentiate yourself with employers, if you wanna like actually set yourself out to not just have a great career, but have a career you're proud of and making the world a better place, being ahead of that, like it's gonna become table stakes that you can do the hard creation of the technology. Employers are going to be looking more and more for people who can't just create the technology, but can actually navigate these tensions that are going to come up around these really hard technologies. Because what we get a lot in the overall movement and what we hear a lot in response to this question is, you know, we need more public awareness. Absolutely. We need more policy. You know, absolutely. But 
the conclusion we came to is if we wait for the public to become aware of a problem, if we wait for the, the government to put in place policy, we're always going to be chasing a technology horse that left the barn a long time ago. We need to get upstream into the, the way, the mental models, the, the beliefs and the behaviors of the people who are creating the technology, i.e. you, engineers, computer scientists, technologists, the entrepreneurs and business people who are scaling them. And so that's where the concept of tech stewardship came to. And so what is tech stewardship? A professional identity and an orientation and a practice, which basically just means we're discussing, refining, and imagining new ways to help ensure technology is beneficial for all. Technology that's more purposeful, responsible, inclusive, and regenerative. And so these kind of map to the four behaviors of tech stewardship. But what's really important about this is not to ignore the tensions that come up between this. Like someone mentioned earlier in the chat that, you know, part of it is like who's making the decisions and what are they kind of biasing in. Um, in tech stewardship, what we look at is different people have different perspectives and value different things. And it's how we navigate the tensions between those value tensions is how we can better bend the arc of technology towards good. So classically, you're in a for-profit company. You've got to like, you know, provide value to your direct stakeholders, but you also care about the climate. You also care about, you know, equity and inclusion. How do we get better at getting, finding the both end solutions that actually allow us to have a profitable company and do good for the world. And even if you're not in a for-profit company, like think about the climate movement, right? There's a lot of people in the climate movement who today are arguing, you know, hey, this is such a big issue. We're so far behind. We don't have time for wait. We just got to move to solutions. In that same movement, you know, on the other side of the movement, there's people who are saying, wait a minute, if the same people that always make the decisions run off and make the decisions on behalf of the world again, we're just propagating a broken and unjust and, in, and unequal um, you know, a mechanism of, of, of action, and therefore that's illegitimate. And so you see tensions even within nonprofit fields and in in that around these. And so the practice of tech stewardship is not ignoring those tensions, but rather figuring out new ways through them. And so the three kind of core commitments of tech stewardship, and we're going to give you a little bit of a sample of this to kind of as the last like exercise of the session, but the three core commitments of tech stewardship are first to advance understanding about the nature of technology and its impacts. The craziness of our current kind of education system is that most schools on one side of campus were busy training computer scientists and technologists and engineers to create technology. Somewhere on the other side of campus, there's a different group of students who are learning to like critically reflect on the nature of technology and its impacts in philosophy of technology, science technology studies, critical media studies. You know, um, the two groups of students rarely meet unless you go out of your way to kind of connect to some of those other students. And when you do, we're speaking different languages and have different cultures. So how do we actually create more of a base understanding of the nature of this of our, of our uh, technologies and their impacts um, that we can all kind of like build upon? One of the things that comes out of advanced understanding is debunking the myth that tech is neutral. In fact, and someone alluded to this earlier, you know, our values shape and are shaped by technology. So how do we understand our own values and the dominant values of our profession? Like what are the dominant values of computer science? And how are those values being embedded in the tech that we create and then shaping, you know, reshaping society in that co-evolution? So imagine you're a computer scientist working in Silicon Valley for a social media platform. You're building tech that's probably gonna scale globally, right? Like there's gonna be people in mainland China using that social media practice. Probably without even realizing it, you're going to be embedding the values of Silicon Valley, transparency, openness, you know, a certain into that, into the very fabric of that tech, which is then going to interact with very different kind of dominant values in other countries about, um, you know, about privacy and kind of transparency and whatnot in, in probably positive and negative ways. The challenge is now most of us who are being trained to create technology are under this misconception that the technology is neutral. And even if we're beyond that, how do you actually deal in a world where, wait a minute, so how do I make sure I'm not overprivileging my values or the values of computer science when I'm trying to ensure benefit for all? And then the final is, you know, how do you actually take this into your day-to-day -day work? How can we, you know, when you're working in that company or in that startup or in that government agency, wherever you are, how do you find these, spot these tensions day-to-day -day and kind of um, be able to do something about them? So in the practice, text to practice program, which I'm going to tell you more about at the end about if you're interested, how you can get involved. Um, one of the things we do is kind of simulate some real world experiences. So we're going to, this is our final kind of dialogue um, that I want to kind of engage you with is let's think about the case of 
predictive policing algorithms. So this is an article from the MIT Technology Review about predictive policing algorithms. And there's basically kind of two types of predictive policing tools. One is location-based algorithms, um, which link kind of between places, events, and historical crime rates to predict where crime is more likely to happen so that, you know, like maybe around certain weather conditions or a large sporting event so that police can say, okay, we're going to deploy our resources here and here. The other type of tool uses data that's common uses data about people such as their age, gender, marital status, history of substance abuse to predict whether or not they will repeat as offenders. And this is often used um, by courts to determine pre like, you know, um, sort of um, things on bail and sentencing. And so what this article is stating is there's a long history of data being weaponized. Um, in, in the article, they're talking about the US, so they're talking in particular about black communities um, but basically, you know, if you're using classic problem with um, big data, right, if your data set has these biases and baked in, then, you know, your tech may be, you know, kind of fostering and reinforcing these, um, these biases ahead of time. So what's being argued here is, um, you know, um, that these technologies actually shouldn't exist. And so the question I want to pose to you to start off is, um, Let's imagine you're in a, a company and you're part of the sort of leadership team. So this is something that very um, could well happen to you after you graduate, right? You're in a company. You might be at a company that has an opportunity to work on this very type of technology or something similar. So imagine you're in the leadership team of that Um, Am I frozen or is Mark frozen? I think Mark is frozen. Okay, let me uh, send a, a text. I'll, I'll send Mark a text. Oh, he logged out. Okay, he knows. Let's wait for a moment. <clears throat> um, there we go. Sorry hey, about Mark. that. Sorry about that. Yeah, I don't know where I dropped though. As um, I was talking you, about. Sorry. Yeah. I think you were just starting to talk about the. Um, this two sides, yeah. Okay, yeah. So basically, like, I want to kind of simulate this idea of, you know, you're on a leadership team and there's a debate because, you know, you got an opportunity to bid on a project that could be really lucrative to build predictive policing technology. And you're debating as a leadership team whether you should take it. And um, so kind of take turns, put yourself on one side of the debate and say, all right, what are the, all the arguments I can think of against taking this project? And then think about all the art, you know, um, the other side, and what are all the arguments for? And once again, you can throw them right into um, the mural here, or you can throw them into the chat. But you know, this is the type of situation you may find yourself in in a career. So, um, you know, give yourself this opportunity to kind of almost, um, um, you know, simulate this potential future scenario for yourself. And so we'll let people kind of uh, gather your thoughts and add a few things. And once again. If any kind of brave soul wants to volunteer uh, um, verbally sharing a couple things, that would be great too. This one takes a little bit more reflection and writing, so maybe we'll just give it a second here. While people are typing, I can say that, you know, we didn't have anything quite this distinct when my my career in consulting engineering but there's lots of things that could have been debated like this if we'd actually stopped and, and taken a little bit more of a principal stance on things. So let's see, the, um, yes, the problem is not with the AI as the AI itself is not the bias. If anything, the bias would be in the data set fed into the AI. Um, I saw, I think it's unfair to, to fault the AI for this. Okay, not a bad point. So it um, depends on, I guess, what you call the project and what you call the tool. Like, are you creating the AI or to what extent are you engaging with the data set? And then you know, are there things within the way you would create the AI for this application that might that might sort of bias it one way or the other? Uh, but an excellent point there. No, um, but they need to have a more inclusive database. Um, if the people designing the AI already have biases, then the AI will already have those biases, um, baked in biases. Yeah, so there's a lot on the kind of baked in biases side. Excellent. This is interesting because we actually had a guest lecture on uh, data biases in AIs, specifically regarding uh, medical devices. Cool. Right? So yeah, I mean, the same thing shows up. Yeah, the a... same thing shows up yeah. everywhere. Yeah. But you know, there there is like a, uh, I don't think I actually put the slide in here, right? But um, 
if you think about uh let me just see if i can anyway i had a slide in a um uh in a in another deck where there's actually some um you know a couple books that were written about sort of past the tech uh, um uh, past technologies and like both physical te technologies and digital technologies so like architects of death like the the architects and engineers who who designed the concentration camps in in nazi germany you know morally should they have done that or not right we, you know it's not as just you know it's a little bit more distinct and after the fact in this example but it brings up actually some similar questions about responsibility or this famously ibm you know made early computers that helped kind of make the holocaust more efficient right and and you know, again, what, you know, should IBM have done that back at that time, right? And what's the responsibility of the person creating the tech to either, you know, do that or not? Normally in the program, and when we have more time, we actually get people working in breakout groups, and we think about sort of like yes and no. And what we get sort of um, some typical arguments against taking the project would be, you know, current algorithms are unjust and reinforce existing inequalities. Policing algorithms can lead to totalitarianism. Computer scientists ethically should not contribute to unjust systems and practices. Um, refusal to design algorithms could invoke, you know, deeper reform. Like maybe it, you know, stops some of the people from using it who shouldn't be using it. Um, and you know, it, what sort of company would we be if we took this project? You know, are some of the arguments here against? On the for side, you hear things like policing is necessary for a well-functioning society, law and order. So it might be messy, but we got to do it, right? Um, computer scientists can influence the making of better algorithms. Um, you know, the data could help social workers analyze underlying causes of crime. Like maybe we can fix some of these problems. Maybe, um, you know, maybe we could make more efficient use of limited public resources with this kind of uh, data. And accepting this work, you know, is going to help to sustain our company and our team, which is a good, you know, we're good people. And we could, you know, so you get these kind of, you know, arguments on either side. And you can almost imagine like a like a, a tug of war in a, in, a, in a conference room somewhere happening. It might be happening right now around whether to take a project like this. So now I want to step out of the debate. In our society, like, you know, we're actually taught to debate, pick a side and see if you can win, right? Step out of the debate for a second and think, can we integrate something? So that's that's not just take yes or no as, a, as an answer. Let's say we're going to come back to the people that put out this request for proposal, and we're going to say, okay, we're willing to bid on this project if. So what conditions might you put back to the client to say, okay, we'll take this project, but only if um, certain things are in place because we're worried about this and this and this. So we'll put in the middle here now a um, uh, a sort of like a, a conditions uh, piece here. So um, under what conditions, if any, like it's totally fine to say, like, listen, you know, um, I, I think these things are so broken, I wouldn't touch it anyway. That's that's a valid kind of stance to take. But can you think of some conditions that you might come back with and say, all right, we'll bid, but we want to see this and this and this. So once again, if people want to throw things in the uh, in the mural, that's great. Or if you want to um, throw it in the chat. And if anyone wants to um, unmute and share a thought, that would be great as well, too. And I so wish we could do this in person and have some smaller groups and everything, because this is a lot of fun when you really can have, you know, a group of four or eight people kind of think through either side of the debate and come up with some options, which we've done a lot in in different settings. But it's a little hard in this larger group. But, you know, I want to give you a sense of of of, uh, you know, this is a real life scenario you could hit and what might you come up with. So here's someone's writing. Maybe if the people designing the AI are a diverse group of varying ideas. Perfect. Right. So. Um, we want to make sure our team is diverse and has good um, has, has a good range. We want to, um, um, or maybe we could have a design committee, like that idea of a citizen jury. Maybe they, we have people drawn from, you know, the corrections institution, from prison abolitionists, different, or um, for, um, um, uh, you know, various kind of advocacy groups be involved in kind of shaping and making sure that this thing doesn't get off the rails. Um, someone in the chat said good pay. Hopefully, yeah, the good. Hopefully, the pay would be there plus the uh, kind of benefit for society. Um, uh, Kai is saying that his computer died and he lost some of the chat messages, but I think people are just starting to respond to this one, Kai. Um, you know I, I'm, I'm missing the question here, but go ahead. 
Exactly. Yeah, the, the question being, you know, under what conditions, if any, so not a yes or no, like you could come back and say to the people that are putting up the RFP, like we'll bid, but only if. And you know what's you know what's interesting about this from my experience is you know you might think this might hurt your chances to get a job. My experience is more often it helps. It's like wow, you know, um, it's like these guys are sophisticated. They're seeing the pitfalls we know we're going to face, and they're coming back with solutions. Right? They're saying that we should have you know empower a kind of a panel of of representatives from all these different areas and they should have direct input on things they're saying that it shouldn't be a one-time project but actually they're only going to take the project if we will commit to you... in the years that follow to actually have um follow-up to make sure that the what we intended to happen is actually happening so mm -hmm. correct, okay. correct to unintended consequences right so some of these things can actually it's a win-win they can actually set you apart as being more sophisticated and help you get the job um if you if you kind of break free of this oh we just have to decide yes or no well in real life there's often you know door number three right uh there's another one transparency oh that, yeah someone started yeah transparency uh to the reason to the reason of results excellent that's a great one right so how do you you know um uh how do you show people like make the logic transparent so it's not just because i think there's a tendency when people say oh it's an ai answer and it's like looks really precise people, you know, um, will often not kind of um, interrogate where that came from and why. And so to what extent can you make that um, transparent uh, for everyone? That's an excellent response. Um, some other people typing there too. So I'm watching the time and I know we, um, we don't have a huge amount of time left, but hopefully this at least gives you a little bit of a, um, a taste. Was there anyone who wanted, I heard someone maybe unmuting there. Was there someone who wanted to actually comment on this one before we move, keep moving? Okay, maybe not. Um, okay, so um, what cases like this bring up is that uh, one of the challenges with technology is like there's there's actually a myth of rationality that's been documented amongst computer scientists and engineers and other kind of people who create technology. And the myth is that, hey, like if you just give me all of the data, I'll tell you the rational right answer. Like the, there's a rational right answer to every sort of technology-based question. In reality, Technology by definition is always being created to meet human needs and wants. And there is no one rational right answer when it comes to human needs and wants because different people will have different perspectives and value different things. So take a classic example of the cell phone, right? We probably all felt a little bit of this tension within ourselves between I value convenience and the cell, you know, like my cell phone is really helping me with a lot of things that make my life convenient. I also value my privacy, but um, man, it's making, you know, like, it's, it's really, you know, everything my cell phone's doing and all the apps on it are really kind of like pushing me towards giving up my privacy to like get more and more convenience. So I feel that tug of war in myself and it's kind of plays out both within me, within our society, right? And you see these kind of dynamics and there isn't a right or wrong, like convenience and privacy are both good. In the perfect world, I want the best of both, but oftentimes it becomes an either or, right? And so what we do in, with tech stewardship is we help people to actually get better at spotting these tensions and finding both end solutions, just like in the predictive policing algorithm. Yes, no. Okay, actually, what's the what are the both end solutions where you can get some of the, you know, the, the best of what's on both sides of the debate? Um, within the program, we introduce, we use actually a quote from Jurassic Park to kind of frame the meta tension that tends to happen in, in when it comes to technology. And it's that quote of, you know, like we were so um, busy wondering, can we do it? We didn't stop to say, should we do it? Just like, you know, in the beginning when we were talking about optimism and pessimism and how we need the best of both, we need both the best of can we do it thinking and should we do it thinking if we want to avoid, you know, kind of all these dystopian tech futures. So in the program, as we're kind of introducing this to people, we actually use a tool called a polarity map. And what it does is it kind of walks through, like, what are all the great things around a can we do it mindset? Our action orientation, it emphasizes an efficiently utilizing resources to achieve focused purpose and deep benefits for our direct stakeholders. This is like design, this is human-centered design. Focus on your stakeholder and get into it. This is the best practice from business. Know your customer, right? This is great. I mean, that's, these are all good things until you overdo can we do it thinking to the exclusion of should we do it. And then you start to see a tendency to jump to action too quickly in a myopic fashion that results in unintended consequences and missed opportunities. Or in Jurassic Park speak, everyone gets eaten by a dinosaur, right? So on the other side, and well, so can we do it? We have to think about our own values. Am I more of a can we do it leaning person or 
should we do it learning person? I would say, and then what about my communities? I'm part of the computer science community. I would say computer science tends to lean more, can we do it? Great, that's a strength. Again, as long as you don't overdo it. On the should we do it side, you get you know, a reflective orientation that emphasizes cultivating systems um, that allows us you know, to make broad contributions to society, to a wide range of stakeholders. Great, who wouldn't want that? Well, when you overdo should we do it thinking to the exclusion of can we do it, which tends to have, you know, um, you start to get analysis paralysis, like lost in complexity, nothing happens. There are a lot of environments that, you know, whereas business tends to be more can we do it, um, government and nonprofit tend to be more should we do it. Whereas engineering and computer science tend to be more can we do it. Um, you know, um, a lot of like philosophy and social sciences can tend to be a little bit more should we do it. What we find is when it becomes a tug of war and either or, we kind of get what everyone fears, like, you know, failing to realize the promise of technology or, or some like dystopian outcome. But if we can get more sophisticated in finding the both end solutions, as tech stewards, we can shape technology more towards the benefit for all. Kai, go for it. I'm, I'm just looking at the time mark. And I want to save time for a couple questions. I okay, cool. Ask for students uh, on students behalf. So yeah, so I'll um so I'll just say uh, to wrap up, all of this like as like um uh there's a tech stewardship practice program that we've launched and it's um uh it's it runs kind of every semester. It's 12 hours online, self-paced, and it's designed to kind of overlay your coursework and your co-ops. Um, you can learn more about it programs at techstewardship.com, and there's a there's actually a free registration code so that you can um that you can get a free registration as a Lausanne student. Um, and so I'll put that in the chat. So if you want to get more of this, like everything we've done here is kind of drawn from that program. And it's kind of like five practice cycles around each of the three core commitments. And they're all around these types of questions. So the first one is the default trajectory of technology. And you get, you know, just a little bit of a deeper kind of intro into all of that. This is what it looks like online on the platform, like a short video that intros a concept, the chance to reflect and hear from some others, a debrief. Um, and at the end, you get a, um, a micro-credential a tech stewardship practice program micro credential you can put on your LinkedIn and you get a whole bunch of chances to like, a network and connect with other students and professionals through the program and you get introduced to like the actual behaviors of tech stewardship and and um, kind of peeled the onion a little bit of, of how to um, how to uh, um, uh, you know practice tech stewardship day in day out last thing Kai I'll just quickly pay um, in the in the practice program we share a bunch of examples of practicing tech stewards um, practicing tech stewardship. I'm going to play this one really quickly from, um, this is a recent graduate sharing her kind of tech stewardship experience. Hi, my name is Vanessa Pony, and I'm a tech steward. When I think about realizing diversity, there's a lot that I experience in a day-to-day -day world as a queer woman of color who is an engineer, but how I want to channel that passion is into my work. So as a toy engineer, when I think about toys, we've actually had this challenge in industry where, of course, there's boy toys and there's girl toys. And you might think that that's only seen in the aisles, but actually it's reflected internally in consumer financial reporting. It is ingrained into how this industry was created and where it's at today. So what I've been trying to do throughout the last several years of being in this industry is advocate behind closed doors of how can we change this? How can we evolve the understanding of the gender binary and gender stereotypes to evolve the actual products themselves and even how we market and talk about these products? Thankfully, my company has been very progressive in this mindset, and we actually recently completely changed the business unit names. So the boys team is now Wheels and Wheels and Action, and the girls team is now Dolls and Interactive. So what's really exciting about this is that it's the first step towards a much bigger conversation about the actual products, how we can evolve them, how we can market them to both and all genders, and how we can ensure that in the future, we are progressing our understanding of the needs of society so that when a kid takes their product home and is enjoying it, they don't have to have the weight of society on their hand, on their shoulders telling them that they need to be fitting into XYZ box. So that's texture chip. These are the types of examples that are in the program and, and what you're sort of being supported to get better at. And Vanessa there, like she is rocketing up the leadership in that company because She's not just, you know, another engineer who's, who knows how to create the technology. She's seeing these tensions and helping find practical ways forward. So it can really set you apart when you're um, in the job market. So again, the, the link's in there. If you register for the program, you can start on your own time um, as soon as you want. Um, and that's all I had for like the overall content. So over to you, Kai. 
So <clears throat> first is if you could send the link to me because yeah. then we can't copy and paste on, on, on your oh, okay. uh, Zoom. Um, it's, uh, it's locked for security reasons. Well, you can but also use... type in um, programs at tech. If you go to like the actual uh, programs at techsteward.com, when you go register, um, there's the, the paid version. But if you scroll down, there's actually a link for your oh, okay. the free thing there too. So okay. if you just type in programs.techsteward.com, you can get it that way. But I'll also share the links with you offline too. Awesome. So I just have a couple questions, actually one burning question on top of my mind, actually let's call it two parts, right? So we have a class of a um, hundred something right now, not 93 students now, but really it's getting class of 600. And, uh, and if you were to stand from your position, which is getting to, you know, establish career, having had at least two, three established careers and uh, worked in a variety of both within engineering company and then really, uh, I would say, really at the uh, intersection between policy, uh, technology and innovation, right? And, you know, both change lab and tech storeship. And you're also surrounded by Mars, right? Which is one of the biggest innovation hubs in, uh, in Canada. So, Given all your position, you have a group of first year computer science students, other than I know you would say like register and take the tech storage practice program as something that they can do, right? So other than that, what would be an advice that you would give to these students that would set them up so that, you know, they can uh, both succeed professionally and, you know, be on the road to tech storage? And uh, and then uh, then if you take a step forward, is maybe four years, five years from now, when they're in their first job, what would be your recommendation then? Right. So so two part question. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and you know I would say like when I graduated, um, and I think it's pretty similar today, right? You come out like what are the job postings? What can I kind of you know what do I apply for? Am I right fit for it? Right. Like, that's the standard way of thinking don't be standard. You know what I mean? Like paint outside the lines, like network, connect with people, ask the questions that other people aren't asking. Like we go in and we think, okay, they've got all these things that they need from us. Like on a technical, I need to technically be able to do those things. That can be true, but that's not going to set you apart from the stack of resumes. If you come in, like instead of the predictive policing thing where, you know, in that one, we gave you a situation where, you know, you're on a leadership team of a company already. Some of the scenarios we do is you're in a job interview and you start interviewing them about whether or not, um, you know, how, how well their tech stewardship kind of practices. Like, hey, you guys make drones, you know? Um, I, you know, I love like drone technology for all these reasons, but I'm worried about all of these ways that drones could be misused. What are you doing? You know, asking that type of question ups your chances of getting the job and setting yourself apart. And if you're just another person who's got a technical list of things, it's really hard to stand out. If you're the kind of person who realizes that the technical and questions and these kind of socioethical questions are actually entwined, and often these are the biggest bottlenecks, then you set yourself apart and you have a more fulfilling career. So you're both more successful in your career, like Vanessa at that toy company, and um, and you know you can feel better about that career too because you're finding those ways to bend the arc for good. So don't don't assume that the way things are structured and systems are right. You know, challenge and question and um, and do it in a way that's kind of open and um and generous so like imagine again vanessa and that toy company if she'd come in and said you guys are doing it wrong and like you know you know uh here i am i've just graduated and like you need to fix all of this she would have hit a brick wall but she did and she got in there and she found the practical ways to actually bend the arc and it's good for her career it's good for that company you know and it's it's good for the world right thank you so much mark i think you answered both questions you want to shot there uh, <laughs> We're at the end of our time, and uh, does anyone have any burning questions for us? Uh, you can just drop a line on uh, on chat. Um, or I mean, I can stay hand. on if, if there's the chance, right? I can stay on for a few minutes. Like, I know in a class like this, again, a lot of people, you know, are kind of working on something else or whatever. But if there's any of you who've been, like, listening and are really engaged, like, I'm happy to chat for a bit here, too. Because, uh, you know, this is what I wish I'd had when I was in first year. You yeah. know, it's like... I was head head down, passing the next math exam, passing the next thing. And it was like, I was, you know, 10 years into my career before I started, you know, someone said to me like, wait a minute, what's the world you want to see and how can you contribute to it? And, 
Um, my hope for the future is that people get that, you know, can have this type of conversation in first year and not, you know, 15 years later. So I'm happy to anyone who wants to talk through things, I'm happy to chat. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, we can stay on for a couple minutes, but, uh, you know, other students don't have to stay. And I just want to thank you so much for, uh, for joining us and uh, for giving us this talk. And uh, for all the students, uh, I will be uh, talk to Mark very briefly. And, uh, since I, and I hopefully I can get those reflection questions up relatively soon. And I'll send another note with the uh, how we're going to approach reflection this semester, which is similar, but just a little more consistent, hopefully. Uh, and uh, I think our next one is in a couple of weeks and we'll bring back uh, Evan Hu, who, uh, by the way, was uh, introduced to me by Mark. So <laughs> we're all connected here. Uh, until then, uh, we'll s until then, well, enjoy the start of your semester. Take care, everybody. Excellent. Cool. All right, Mark. Let's, let's see if anybody wants to ask questions, and uh, and then uh, then we can uh, we can see how I still have to I still have to take the actual program. I want to uh, take the, uh, the 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 final product. I need to find yeah. the uh, find the time to do it. <laughs> yeah, there's a direct question I got from someone here about how to build a team to start a company. Um, you know, speaking of things that you know, oftentimes we don't get in our base education, right? Like, I mean, if you want to. If you want to get a startup and you know build a startup and I, have a transformative tech, um, I mean it's probably in your course, Kai. But a lot of times people don't get that as much. I, I want I want to just chime me and say that's the topic of next lecture. Ah, perfect. There you go. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think this um, this uh, um, the strongest teams are the ones that actually know how to navigate tensions together too, right? So this type of with, with several organizations now, we're not just kind of introducing individuals to tech stewardship, but we're helping them create a tech stewardship culture in the organization that helps them to like, you know, stay ahead of these things. Because um, more and more often, the main reason startups and others fail is um, um, around these, like the intersection of the, of the tech and socioethical kind of things. Like that's, and so if you have a resilient team that knows how to like, kind of have that internally almost as a microcosm, you can stay ahead of, of sort of um, the world on those things and, and be a leader rather than kind of, you know, the, the world's full of amazing tech that failed because it, it you know, it failed to stay ahead of some of these issues or failed to stay to kind of engage in, in a useful way on some of these things. So, yeah. We're down to 40. So it's, it's just us friends now. So if anyone else, wants I, to I don't have, a, I don't have any questions in my private box. So if you got anything, uh, questions, or if you got anything else to share, I, you're, I'm, I'm happy. I'm all yours here, Mark. Cool. Well, we have uh, Danny saying thanks here for engaging presentation. There we go. Yeah. I would, I would love if uh, you can send me that. Yeah, I just sent it actually. I gave, gave uh, you the link. The two, oh, so yeah. no, I was uh, I was asking. I would love that video. It will, it will fit right in another course, and that, that I'm teaching this term, and I'm hoping to still hoping mm -hmm. to get you into uh, into a guest lecture. Now, now that I mean, I'm uh, I'll speak to. I I really enjoyed this uh, this session, Mark. Yeah. You mean the Vanessa the Vanessa video? Is that the one you mentioned? Yeah, the Vanessa video. And uh, if you have a couple more I can share with uh, with students, that would be really cool. Yeah, I mean, the cool thing is like, I mean, as you know, all of this content is open source. I'm actually talking to Jeff Harris is going yeah. to, um, I think he's going to with his, I think it's a mechanical engineering class. He's going to do advanced understanding and deliberate values in the classroom and then have them do do P1 and like the practice behaviors on the platform. I mean, oh, each, that's cool. each practice cycle has, you know, um, has four, you know, three or four of those kind of responses from different people. So it's embedded through the whole program. You get different yeah. voices throughout. Um, yeah. I mean, so yeah, all of that, if, if you're going through it yourself and you see things you want, all of that's available. And over time, we're actually curating more and more. So um, we're starting a program with the Energy Futures Lab in Alberta, where they're basically yeah. going to like take their engineering um, Energy Futures Lab community and create out, like capture a whole bunch of voices on these questions so oh, that they have one kind of version. Answer. Right. Yeah. And so we're, I'm starting to talk to Partnership for AI about maybe doing like an AI version of the program. And yeah. basically, 
you know, what we find time and time again for people who did the program is hearing all these voices, you know, is the real, is the real yeah. kind of, um, you know, the benefit. So tech stewardship is really just about no one's got to figure it out. So we're just connecting people yeah. to figure it out together, essentially. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to pause the recording here. Yeah. And, uh,